Welcome back to the channel and welcome back to my part two video of the awesome Tracer 9 GT Plus. In the last video, if you cast your minds back, I took this out for a little bit of a blip around the countryside as a first ride. And the conclusions were, you know, for the sports part of a sports touring, this bike is very sporty. But in this video, we're going to take this out for a longer run. We're going to go down to Corfe Castle in Dorset, going via sandbanks across the ferry, so it's probably 150 miles there, probably a 300 mile round trip maybe. I've, I've filled up with fuel, I've reset my trip meter so we can see exactly how much fuel we use on this trip and basically use this bike really for what it's in, intended for, long distance cruising with a bit of fun factor. I've added my little additional bit of uh, wind protection to the top of the screen because this screen isn't brilliant when you're up to higher speed so I've added my little add-on that was 15 quid on eBay bought it a few years ago that is brilliant if you want a little bit more helmet protection I'm six foot two but in this video we're just going to take this bike out for a bit of a run see what it's like and report back to see if this is a potential purchase for one of you guys in the future so if that sounds of interest settle down get a cup of tea it is a little bit nippy today and it's two o'clock in the sun. It may be dark by the time I get the Corfe Castle, but at least I'll be able to see what the lights are like and if it's got illuminated switch skin, all that stuff. But anyway, settle down, grab yourself a drink and Chopsy, roll the intro. So as I said, I've actually been pretty impressed with this beastie in my first ride and I've been using this quite a lot since I did that first ride with you. As you can see, it's pretty dirty. I should really give it a clean. I will after this run. But it, it's impressed me. It's, it's a very sporty bike. I, I, there is some things I don't like, which we'll come on to. I'm certainly not saying it's the perfect motorcycle, this. And at £15,100, it's getting quite pricey and it's getting into sort of the price of the BMW XR or it's more expensive than the GX Suzuki. So it's really getting up there with those litre bikes. And is it, you know, is it worth that much money? I know it's got loads of tech on it. So you're paying for the tech and you know, the adaptive cruise control, all of that stuff. But is it a £15,000 motorcycle? Does it feel like a £15,000 motorcycle to ride? That's what I'm going to let you know. Let's jump on. So I've configured my sat-nav. First little moan about this, but get straight in there with the negative, is you've got that lovely big screen on this bike and it's got all of the navigation stuff so you can have on-screen navigation, but you need a Garmin or you need the Garmin subscription to be able to use the navigation. There's no Android Auto, there's no uh, Apple CarPlay, you know, so unless you want to subscribe to the Garmin app, I don't know how much that costs you a month, you can't use it, so you can't use any of that on-screen navigation, so you need an external phone, which is what I've done here with my Ultima add-ons, mount some money off these, straight in there, straight in there with the sponsors, some money off Ultima add-ons below, but you have to have, you know, externally, I prefer that anyway really, because it's not taking up screen space and it's pretty convenient, so uh, yeah, Google, good old Google Maps are leading the way here. Oh, the bike has a really fun nature to it. I mean, it's, it's based on the MT-09, the XSR 900. I think it's maybe the identical chassis and swinging arm setup to what is on the XSR 900. So you've got a really fun, playful platform. That CP3 motor is a lot of fun, loads of torque, only 117 horsepower at top, but it's got a lot of torque, a lot of drive. It's, it's a fun power plant. Slight criticisms I've noticed during my time with this is it's quite a raw feeling motor. There's a few vibes through the bike, through the seat, through the bars. You know, it's not a silky smooth power plant. It's quite a raw, a raw engine. So that is one slight criticism, you know, when you're talking of pricing a bike at 15,000 pounds. You know, it's quite a raw experience, that engine. It's a lot of fun, and don't, don't get me wrong, it's an awful lot of character as well. But what I want to see is on this trip, is that rawness, those vibes, are they going to become irritating? 
when you're sort of sat at higher speeds for longer. So I'm doing uh, just under 70 miles an hour. My little lad on screen is really reducing any sort of helmet wind now so that the wind is sort of here in front of my helmet. There's, there's nothing really directly on my helmet. It's sort of in front a bit more. So that's doing a really good job of giving me a little extra bit of protection. As I say, I'm six foot two, 20 stone, so I'm quite tall. And that is also in the highest position. No, it's not. It's in the lower position. Oh, but in the higher position, that's a proper bubble of car. So with that screen and the little add-on, it transforms the way this, this tracer screen works. I mean, it's fine if you're just nipping out with the, with the standard screen, but if you know you're going to be on the bike for a couple of hundred miles and you know you're going to be doing some higher speed stuff, I really recommend something like that. I think you can get ones for about 40 quid, but that was just a generic eBay jobby. And I think it's about 15 quid. Something else I've noticed, which I'm getting used to it, but it's a little bit irritating. There's a, quite a lot of like snatch to the clutch. When you let it out, it wasn't too bad that time. But when you let it out sometimes, it can, you can feel it sort of, sort of catching like that a little bit. And I've ridden another bike like that. The M1000 RR was a bit like that. As you release the clutch, you could feel a little bit like the clutch almost rotating and pulsing a little bit as you let the clutch, clutch out. It's no biggie, you get used to it, but if you want to pull away quickly, you've got to sort of get used to that clutch feel a little bit. So there's a little bit of a funny pulsing sensation through the clutch, but other than that, smooth, light, well not smooth, it's a bit pulsy, but it's light at least. The Tracer 9 is definitely set up as a sporty bike. I know this has got electronic suspension, um, you've got two levels of, you've got, you've got an A1 and an A2 electronic suspension. Unfortunately, I was expecting to be able to go into those settings and customise them, you know, but they're, they're, they're fixed, you can't customise, it's just A1 or A2, sort of comfortable or sporty, I guess. And even the comfortable A1 or A2 setting is quite sporty still. There's no option which will give you that absolutely sort of waft along ride. So it's a little bit disappointing you can't go in and then customise and tune those two settings further. But I would have perhaps liked one of the settings to go a little bit more comfortable or give me the option to go into the settings to find that comfortable, to make it comfortable. There's plenty of overtaking power. I know it's only 117 horsepower, but there's loads of power. You don't ride this bike and come away thinking yeah it'd be great if it was a bit quicker I know a lot of people say oh it needs the MT10 engine and I do agree I do agree we need a, a Tracer 10 for sure but not because you really need more power I just think that will bring a little bit more refinement because I do think this engine it feels a little bit raw um, the MT10 engine feels smoother for sure Come on, are we clear, are we clear? Let's go for it. There's loads of overtaking power there. Absolutely loads of it. And it's one of those bikes that eggs you on. It eggs you on to go faster. It eggs you on to push it. And then already this was going to be a nice, relaxing, comfortable tour down to Corf Castle. <laughs> but already I, I, I'm pushing this. I'm, I'm, I'm pushing it round the bends, I'm getting on the gas. It's, I think this is the perfect description of what a sports tourer should be. This has definitely got a lot of emphasis on the sport. Big bend in sport mode. Hang off the bike a bit. Yeah, it's very good. <laughs> when you want to go a bit faster and get some smiles under your helmet, smiles per mile on this bike <laughs> I think it's really good come on out the way you you've almost got to keep reminding yourself that you've actually got panniers on the back because you, 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 you're so sporty you forget completely that you've got them on board It's quite a lively chassis. I think it's got, you know, a quite a short wheelbase, the XSR, and you can sort of feel that, you know, it's it's bordering on flighty almost. 
Whereas the GX is a very long, stable machine. Like right, Suzuki's always are, they always go for stability. This is definitely a bit, little bit twitchy, a little bit twitchy. It's quite a short wheelbase, but that does make it fun. You know, it, it's very difficult, I guess, for these manufacturers. There's obviously a decision made in how they want the bike to handle. And I think because this is based on fun bikes like the XSR and the MT-09, you know, that's coming across onto this touring machine and uh, which means it changes direction lovely but it's bordering on a little bit twitchy right so anyway we've been going for half an hour i've had a lot of fun already we're still getting 49.1 miles per gallon on the onboard computer so that's not bad so then i have been giving it a little bit as well i've not exactly been feathering it along so we're still getting 50 miles per gallon We've done 20 miles. Uh, we've got 46 to go until we get to Sandbanks. Ba 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 da boom. <sighs> well, it's a nice day for it. Another slight gripe. Oh god, I'm, I'm turning into a right old motor on this one, aren't I? But another slight gripe. Being a touring machine, there's no distance to empty on the fuel gauge and the fuel gauge has just got four segments to it you know and the first half is just one segment so i mean that i'd really like on a touring machine a distance to empty or a more accurate fuel gauge i mean you do have a fuel gauge but it's just a little bit inaccurate so we'll see how long how much distance i go before like the fuel gauge does anything at all Let's get over here and let's have a little bit of a play with that adaptive cruise control. So let's set it. I want the bike to do 85 miles an hour if there's nothing in front of me. So it's sitting at 78, it's catching up with this car in front. It, the, the car's there, it's detected that car in front. I've got it to sit as close as possible behind him. So that is actually, for, for 70 miles an hour, that is actually quite close, isn't it? So if you wanted to adjust that, there's a button here, and we can say, I wanted a maximum distance on the car in front. So let's go see how extreme it is. So from as close as possible, it's now dropping back. And how far back is it gonna drop for the maximum distance? So that is probably your highway code recommended distance, or two seconds from the car in front. So that's that's the maximum distance, but that's a bit too much. So I, I think two blobs works quite nicely. And let's see where that sits me. And what is good, if you go to overtake, the bike will start accelerating automatically for the overtake. Obviously it's not gonna go very far because it's now detected the other car. But when you, over, when, you, when you indicate, it accelerates for you to pull out and overtake without having to touch the throttle. If you want adaptive cruise control, this I think this is the cheapest motorcycle on the market with adaptive cruise control. All the other brands, if you want adaptive, you're into like the 20 grand mark plus for adaptive cruise control. This is 15 grand gets you adaptive cruise control. And that is quite an incredible price. Anyway, I will turn you off for now because I'm going to be on the motorway for a little bit of time. I'll turn you back on when we get to something a little bit more interesting. I'll see you in a minute. Maybe a time for a quick advert. <laughs> Advert break. So we're 50 miles in, 52, 53 miles into the trip. Just done a good 15 miles of boring motorway work. And what I've realised is the ergonomics on this bike, especially your sort of leg position, is really quite spacious and it's definitely a bit more of an adventure bike sort of feel and size and leg position than like the Suzuki GX. On the GX you can't stand up. I can actually stand up on this like an adventure bike you know to take a little bit of weight off my ass for a little while and you know that's something you can't do on the GX or you can't do on the other sort of GT machines because I think the pegs are a little bit Sort of close, you're a little bit more cramped in the leg. There's definitely a bit more room uh, in the leg on this bike, and I think the bars are perhaps a little bit higher. So you can stand up, you can take weight off your ass, 
which is a fantastic thing when you're doing a bit of distance. So we're 1.7 miles away from the ferry crossing now and we're coming into Sandbanks and I believe Sandbanks is one of the most expensive real estate places in uh, in the whole of the UK I think I think it could possibly be the world as well something wants to make me say the world but it's certainly one of the most expensive houses here um, <laughs> in the UK possibly the world let's see when we get there it's quite nice it's on the beachfront you remember the in-betweeners for those of you who ever watched the in-betweeners the episode when they go I think it's to Swanmore is, is the place I was thinking of when they go to Swanmore and they're battering the fish in the boat, but Neil's punching the fish. Well, that was filmed out in the... Uh, we'll go past that in a minute. We'll go past that in a minute. But that sandbags... I mean, they used to be the most expensive property in the world, but since they filmed the in-betweeners there, I think the prices might have dropped a little bit. Let's <laughs> have a look at some of these places down here. Oh, nice flats. They don't look like the most expensive flats in the world. But I think there's some pretty nice gaffs around here. There we go, look, that one's looking rather nice, isn't it? Well, this is more like it, look at these. Starting to look a little bit more pricey. Oh, there's estate agents there, I should have a look in the window, shouldn't I? See what sort of prices we've got, if I could be bothered to start. Oh, bakery, I mind a nice coffee, actually. Is it? I'm getting a little bit chilly now. I wouldn't mind a coffee if we can find somewhere in a minute before we get on the ferry. I think it's this section out on the sandbank here where it's really expensive. Or well, they put this whole whole seafront section here. It's where it's very expensive. And that's the water, Neil and the uh, and the boys are out on the boat beating fish. That's not a euphemism. I don't know why it's so expensive here. Are they bird watchers? Or in between us on an in between us guided tour. Coffee, never mind all this, we need a coffee. I wonder if there's a coffee place actually at the crossing, I hope so. Because I don't need to stop, I'm perfectly comfortable. Well, how long have we been going for here now? Hour and a half. Hour and a half in the saddle, my ass is in perfect comfort. All right. Coffee shop, coffee shop, coffee shop, shop. Rick Stein, Rick Stein, that's a fish and chip place. Is it a fish and chip place? Rick Stein, sir. Do like a bit of Ricky. Like his fish and chips, anyway. Man, and Bruce should have went there on our best fish and chips, shouldn't we? If we were down that, maybe we need to do a South Coast fish and chips, but fish and chips in the South are rubbish. You cannot find a decent fish and chip place, apart from Rick Stein's, in the South of England. They don't exist. I think you've got to go sort of Nottingham way up north until you get a decent chippy, until you get beef dripping. They don't do beef dripping in the south. You northerners and your chips and your beef dipping, your beef dipping and your gravy and your scraps. They don't do that down south. They don't even do scraps down south. What the hell? They, they've started to catch on with the gravy now, but nothing's done in beef dripping. I'm blaming those vegans. They're stopping all the beef dripping and vegetarians for that matter but yeah there's no decent chips in the south it's absolutely rubbish you've got to go nottingham and upwards for the best fish and chips that's why we never did the best fish and chips in the south because it would be a poor comparison to the northern chips anyway we're on the ferry and it's here already you don't even have to wait for it lovely thank you do you do any coffee i really need a coffee So we're off, we're off. This is the back of the uh, boat. <laughs> okay, can't really call this a ship. And it just pulls itself along on the chains, you know, across. So uh, I can't even think what this stretch of water is called here. I'm not 100% sure, but uh, there we go. Goodbye Sandbanks. Hello Swanage. There's the old trace alert. Look at her there, waiting. Ready and waiting. Sun's getting low. Is it going to be dark by the time we get to Corfe Castle? That's the question. 
what do you call this sort of uh, ship, boat? Must have a certain name, a ferry, not a ferry. You know, one which is on the chains that pulls it across. Has it got a particular name? Let me know in the comments. Oh, it's nice over here, look. Someone fishing. That looks nice, doesn't it? It's very nice over this side. Swan Moor side. I think everyone else has to stop and pay now, but for some reason I've paid on the on the ferry. I don't know why. Why I didn't pay here. <laughs> I guess I guess it's because sometimes motorcyclists don't stop at this toll toll booth. That's the only, thing, only reason I could think why they would have charged me before everybody else. I don't know. Very odd, actually, isn't it? I'm going to have to wait now, aren't I? Can I wait or can I filter through because I've already paid? Oh, I'm going to filter. This could, this could be a bad move. This could be a bad move. And no one's going to let me in now because I don't have to pay. I don't know why I'm even actually thinking I'm pushing in. I'm not pushing in, love. I've already paid. Don't worry. I'm not pushing in. I've already paid my dues. I can imagine what they're saying behind me. I've already paid, love. I don't want to queue up and I've already paid. Hello, mate. Down the point, mate. What down there? Oh, screw it. I've got to go down the bike lane. Oh, that ain't happening, is it? God's sake. Can you open the gate? Can you just open the gate, mate? Any chance you can open the gate? It'd be a lot easier if you open the gate. <laughs> what a stupid setup. Can't get through there now, can I? Anyway, I shouldn't have queued up in the first place. I should have gone in the left lane there. No way I'm getting this coat. It's like, you oh. are. Bollocks. So if you come across on that ferry, get in the bike lane. Don't, don't do what I did. <sighs> I feel like a dickhead now. Nothing new there. Little sit wrap, we're going one hour and 37 minutes. So it's not massively far away, is it? But it is only uh, 10 degrees or so today. Let's have a look at you. That's a very good question, actually. How, what, what, is, what is the temperature? 12 degrees. Ooh, it's a chilly 12 degrees. I'm not so sure about that. I think the bike's been sat, a bit of heat soak going on there. It's more like about eight and uh, we've done 72 miles. I've still got a full tank of petrol, <laughs> according to the fuel gauge. What a load of nonsense. There's also a nice little steam railway in Swanmore, which we went, actually I went on with Mrs. Chops and uh, my, and Chops Junior. Over Christmas they did a Polar Express trip on this uh, steam train. It was very nice. You had to get, we had, you had to go in your pyjamas, so we all went in our PJs. And there was hardly anyone in PJs. It says, wear your pyjamas, and nobody did. And so there's us walking around Swanmore in our pyjamas, and <laughs> dressing gowns, on the Polar Express. But it was really cool. It was very, very good. So if you ever get a chance to do one of those Polar Express steam train rides, I highly recommend it. Even like the actors and stuff. The guy who was playing Tom Hanks' character sounded just like him. Absolutely superb. And yes, we did have some hot, hot, hot chocolate. Well, the sun is bright. Corf Castle. Oh, there it is right in front of us. That is Corf Castle. Or what is left of it. I think there's a car park somewhere here. It was uh, demolished. I can't think. We got, I'll, I'll, I'll do my little bit of research in a minute. But that is it. On top of that natural, a natural mound that is, and they built that castle up there. And it was such an effective sort of stronghold that um, it ended up destroying it because whoever had it, they couldn't get them out of it. This is back in sort of the roundhead sort of days. I'll give you some facts and figures in a minute. I'll pull over. I've got something on my phone. There you go, Corf Castle. What's left of it? I think you can get up there and walk around the ruins, but it looks a little bit steep, doesn't it? What do you have to do to get coffee around here? So we made it. The castle is over there. I've just spent 20 minutes trying to get the parking sorted out. There's a parking meter there. You got, I've had to download the app. 
all the other shit you've got to do and then in the end I have to pay two quid just to set up the account and anyway, I can't be bothered to go through that parking so and it's getting dark it's about four o'clock see that sun is really low and I want to go home so there is Corfe Castle so uh, for those wanting to see Corfe Castle I'll zoom in a little bit um, yeah it's I could walk all the way up there but I'd say it's about 100 foot in the air I've got to take all my crash helmet and kit with me I can't be bothered, sorry. So what I'll do, I will uh, put a bit of information on the screen about it. I'll take some stock footage off <laughs> off of YouTube of the uh, of the castle and stuff. So uh, yeah, just just pretend I did it myself. So there we are, Corfe Castle, Alan Wicker, I am not. <laughs> I think even uh, Carl Pilkington probably could have given you more information about Corfe Castle and at least left the car park area. <laughs> but it's getting really rather nippy now. I'm going to my, uh, my Knock Zero gloves for some proper cold protection on the way home because uh, yeah, it's, it's getting nippy, it's getting nippy. And I want to get home, get warm, put my feet up. So I've done a piss poor job of telling you about Corfe Castle, but hopefully I've given you a better insight into the Tracer 9 GT Plus. It's a great sports touring machine. I think it's the essence of what a sports tour should be. You know, you've got, it's a really good sporty side to the sports tourer where the other sports tourers are maybe not quite so sporty they're more on the touring this is one definitely on the the sports side of it from a comfort point of view exceptionally good i love the fact you can stand up on it to rest your bum you know and it's you, it's the bars are high enough the pegs are low enough to be able to do that like an adventure bike you need to do that that's the whole point of these crossover machines so i like that it is a little bit raw, you know, it's based on the XSR and the MCO9. You know, you, you, those bikes aren't known for their refinement, are they? And it is a little bit unrefined, a little bit vibe, a little bit clunky on the on the gear change and the quick shifter. You know, it's, it's a small, short bike, so it's very agile, a little bit flighty. So, you know, it's brilliant as a sports machine, a fun machine. Um, it, on the motorway as well, you know, at sort of 70, 80, got a few little vibrations, you know, it's quite a raw motor, but overall it is very, very good. Now what I will be doing with Greg is doing a comparison with this and the new GX. When I can get my hands on the new GX in the UK, we're going to do a comparison between the two, because I think these two bikes are sort of really close competitors and sort of very similarly priced as well when you take into account that the GX doesn't have any luggage so I think that's about 15 and a half with luggage so it's probably slightly more expensive than this by the time you've added the luggage which comes standard on this so um, yeah it's going to be interesting between those two so if you're interested in the GX or indeed want to know more about the Tracer then that's the one for you but to watch that of course you've got to subscribe or you'll miss it so please subscribe i hope you've enjoyed this little trip and uh, i will speak to you soon cheers guys well we're probably third of the way home just gone 96 miles into the trip and we finally dropped a half a tank of fuel so up until 96 miles it's been showing as a full tank of fuel still so we've just dropped into half a tank so I'll keep my eye on that now to see how quickly those run. Oh, it's just gone full tank again. It's just gone full tank of fuel. <laughs> so it dropped to half, and now it's just gone full again. So I am almost home, absolutely freezing. I've just spent like 40 minutes set on the motorway, and uh, oh, I'm absolutely freezing. It must, it must be about four degrees. The bike says it's 10 degrees. It's not 10 degrees. Let's turn off the cruise control. I'm happy to report Get out of the way of here a minute. As you can see, illuminated switch gear. Take note, BMW. Illuminated switch gear on this. 
And the front light looks pretty good, looks pretty decent. It's hard to tell because there's a lot of ambient light, but I think the front light is pretty, yeah, pretty reasonable. It'll look terrible on the GoPro. It's not great at low light GoPros. But, um, but yeah, we're almost home. We've done 152 miles and I've got two segments left of my uh, four segment fuel gauge. So no clue how much is left in that but there's two segments left so uh, probably at least another 40 miles so i'd suspect you're, you're sort of talking almost 200 miles on this i would guess but uh, there we go illuminated switch gear 150 miles no problem on the tank and i'm gonna get home because i'm bloody freezing see you on the next one guys